John chapter 7, verse 37 says these words. In the last day, how many believe we're living in the last days? Amen. I do. That great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. There's your invitation, folks. The great invitation of salvation from the very mouth of Jesus Christ. If anyone thirst, let him come unto me and drink. If you're going through struggles in life, you're going through trouble, your mind is tormented, your heart is tormented, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus and drink the water of living life and be filled. So I titled my sermon, Does God Meet Man's Need? A lot of people think that God doesn't meet our needs. But God meets all of your needs, even when you don't know He does. He's always working on your behalf, always opening doors. The problem with mankind is, is we're so impatient. We are an impatient breed of people, are we not? You know, a, a tiger will hunt down his prey. And will go in the, and follow his prey for a long, long time. You tell that prey is tired and then he'll attack it. He's patient. He's patient. We go to McDonald's and if we're not serving a burger in two minutes, we're screaming and hollering. Where's my food? I've been here two minutes. You know, or you're sitting down at the table and nobody's come to say hello to you yet for four or five minutes and you're whining. The place is packed. That's called impatience. We are impatient people. We want service now. We are a now generation. Serve me now. Our problem today is not to believe there is a God, but to be sure that He answers to our highest thoughts of who we think He is. There's a lot of people who think God is something other than who He is. So the problem isn't, is there a God? The problem in life is, is there a God that matches my thinking of who He is? That's what keeps people away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they have their own mindset of who God is. So if it doesn't match, if you preach them, it doesn't match what they think who God is, then they're not going to listen to you. Because that old serpent, the Satan, deceived Eve in the garden with the word pride. P-R-I-D-E. And when you're full of pride and you won't bend your ways and you won't bend your thinking to understand the gospel, you're going to miss out on the greatest truth there ever is, never was, in the history of life. And that is Jesus Christ. So by saying that, is an atheist really an atheist? Do they really believe in nothing? Can somebody actually believe in nothing? Can you? Can you believe in nothing? Do you know what an atheist believes in? Themselves. They believe in their own truth about nothing. It's an old song that says, nothing from nothing is nothing. But if you want to have something, you've got to believe in me, Jesus Christ. You've got to believe in Christ if you want to have something. Does God just not line up to their an atheist's highest thought of who an atheist thinks God is, so they won't believe in God? How many have heard these words in your preaching? Well, that's not what I believe. Don't you preach this to people? They'll say those words, well, that's not what I believe. I says, well, that's what the Bible says. And that's what we need to believe in, is the Bible. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to read a little story before I go on. David prayed and he said this word, thankful for your kindness. Mm -hmm. Kindness is the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen? 
On a typical hot humid summer day in Cincinnati, Joe Delaney and his eight-year-old son were in the backyard playing catch. As the two lobbied back and forth, Joe could tell something was on his son's mind. And at first they talked about Reds baseball, friends, summer vacation, and then the conversation took a more serious turn. Joe felt like a backyard ball player who suddenly found himself in the major leagues. His son said, Dad, is there a God? And Joe had some helpless feeling he experienced on the high school basketball team when he lost sight of a fly ball in the blazing sun. He didn't know whether to move forward or backward or just stay put. A string of tribances raced through his mind. In the end, Joe just was honest. I don't know, Jared. Joe's agnostic, his agnosticism failed to stifle his son's curiosity. So Jared dug a little deeper. Is there a God? If there is a God, how would you know him? I really have no idea, Jared. I only went to church a couple of times when I was a kid. So I don't know a lot about these kinds of things. And Jared seemed deep in thought for a few minutes as the game of catch continued. And suddenly he ran to the house. I'll be right back, Dad, I've to get something. He returned with a helium balloon, fresh from the circus, along with a pen and an index card. His dad says, Show what, Jared, what in the world are you doing? I want to send a message to God. Airmail. Before Joe could protest, his son started writing, Dear God, if you are real and you are there, send people who know you to dad and me. Joe kept his mouth shut, not wanting to dampen his son's enthusiasm. This is silly, silly, he's thinking. And then he goes, But God, I hope you're watching. Jerry let go of the balloon. And they went back to play baseball. Two days later, I became part of the answer to this unusual inquiry Joe and Jared pulled into the free car wash that the church was putting on. <coughs> Joe asked, how much? It's free. No strings attached. Really? But why are you doing this? Joe asked. We just want to show you God's love in a practical way. It was as if that simple statement opened a hidden door to Joe's heart. The look on his face was incredible. Wait a minute. Are you guys Christians? Yeah, we're Christians. I couldn't help but smile. Yes. Oh, he says, and you're, are you the kind of Christians who believe in God? <laughs> What a question, eh? I couldn't help but smile. Yeah, we're that kind of a Christian. After directing a big, big grin at his son, Joe proceeded to tell me the story of releasing the helium balloon with a message only days earlier. I guess you're the answer to one of the strangest prayers God has ever received. How often does an act of kindness become an answer to someone's deepest prayer? A lot of people are trying to find God, but they don't know who God is. God is always intermingling with our deepest thinking, whether we be agnostic, atheist, communist, religious. No matter what type of a person we are, God is always intermingling with our deepest thinking. Whether we're a non-believer, a backslider, amen, a mocker, a scoffer. But the difficulty in life is not, is there really a God? The difficulty is, and it lies in the character of God. Who is God? It's not, is there a God? The question is, who is God? What is the character of God? You know, when you're in trouble, 
And a lot of people are in trouble, even unbelievers, agnostic, I don't care who you are. The first thing we do is, is God help me. Jesus help me! Right? The first thing. So it's not the question of, is there a God? Because the Bible says that God is per eternity in the hearts of every man and child in the entire world. He's placed that thought in your heart. It's there. The question is, what is the character of God? Who have you made God out to be in your mind? And what character have you given him? Is he a Buddhist? Is he a Muslim? Is he a Hindu? Is he a Catholic? Is he a Jehovah Witness? Is he a Mormon? Is he a Christian? Presbyterian? All these different types have different characters of who God is. So that's the question. What is the character of God? Because God has awareness of God in all of us, no matter what you profess you believe. So is there a God is not the question that we're the fathers you. The question is, what is God's character? If there be a God, why is there so much cruelty in the world? I get this all the time. Why does God allow people to die and get killed? And why is there such cruelty all over the world? And why are there earthquakes and all that and stuff? It's like God is up in heaven saying, well, let's uh, be cruel to Dean and Carlina down in Hope, pastor of that church. Let's just be cruel to them now. My mindset is God is not a cruel God. Yeah. God will judge us. And God will judge the world for their sin. And God will judge you for your sin if you don't repent. Amen? Amen. Why are people starving? Because of the sin of man. Because of the decisions of mankind. Once again, we turn to human life. Human life is so eager, excuse me, to find God in your human life. And that's perfectly reasonable. It's perfectly reasonable to try to find God in our lives. Before I was a Christian, I never thought about God. I went to church with my grandma, because I lived in Edmonton on Easter and Christmas. That was it. I didn't try to find God. I didn't care if there was a God. Amen? Because yeah. I had the character of God all figured out in my mind of who He was. So I served that God. That's the God I served until the real Jesus came and called me to Himself. The Bible says in Him we breathe, move, and have our being. It's Christ that we breathe. It's in Him that we move. It's in Him that we have our being, in Jesus Christ. So now when we turn to human life, are there not things in it that look like gross injustices? When you watch the news, sometimes injustice is brought about some form of our own conclusions of who God is. And we question the character of God. Why would God allow this? That's the first question that comes to people's minds on this tragedy. Why would God allow this? Did God allow it? Or did we allow that to happen in our lives because we never took care of the situation that surrounded us for such a long time? I mean, there are things that happen. They happen. But there are things that happen to our lives we can stop mm -hmm. just by taking care of them. And when we don't, we go, why did you allow this, Lord? Why didn't you make me stop doing that? You know God will not make you do anything. He won't impose himself upon you. He loves you so much. Because he wants you to work that will he's given you towards him. Towards him to trust him, to believe in him, to allow him to work his mercy and grace in your life. 
It's God that does it when we open up our hearts to Him and say, Lord, this is me. Help me. So is it God then who is responsible for atrocious things and for things that happen in life? You know, atheism is such an illogical conclusion. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Agnosticism is inconclusive. But granted that God is who He is, how can we go about to love Him with our whole being, mind and soul? We have to trust Him. We can love the Lord by surrendering our lives to Him and trust Him for our lives. Mm -hmm. To surrender to Jesus. That means you have to surrender you, everything you are, to Christ. To His trust. To His authority and dominion over you. You have to give Him reign in your life. Say, Lord, this is me. I messed up. Oh, you all aren't. I messed up. But I'm giving that mess to you. I'm giving it to you. Because I can't handle it. You help me, Lord. I want you. All of you. Amen. Remember we spoke about worship and you lift up your hands and worship and that saying, Lord, I'm giving all to you. You gave all to me. You, my wife's Awesome statement. So you spread your hands on the cross for me. How can I not spread my hands in worship and give all I have to you? I thought that's a try. I said, honey, that's a tremendous quote. And it's true. Because we know who we serve. You can't do that to a false god that you've created in your own mind. You can't do that to a person or an entity that you think is God. But you have begun to serve the right God. Take everything in life. Take the beauty of the skies today. Take the awesome presence and the brilliance of the constellations at night. And you're looking at the stars at night. I love that. I can sit outside and just look at the stars. It's awesome. It shows the glory of God. Especially when it's beaming down on you. I saw a falling star the other night. It was awesome. I followed it. How about the full moon? And the brightness of a full moon. Or the wonderful warmth of the sun. It peeped out at us last night at the barbecue for about 15 minutes. It was so nice. The warmth of the fire and the warmth of the sun. It was great. A cold pool. <laughs> Jeremy got baptized last night. So he knows all about this. How about going down to the river and the pureness of the river, the raging of the waters, and you see the the white raging water. You're just watching that. It's just awesome. Who can give that to us except God? Have you ever seen the salmon flip and flop in the river? Why do we catch those things? Because they taste good, but they also look good in the river. Amen? I like to look up in the sky when it's snowing and watch the snowfall. I like to walk when it's snowing. Or I like to walk right after the snow and breathe in the freshness of the air that God gives us to breathe. When you transfer all these things to your heart, how can you not believe that he's the rock that is much higher than I? How can you believe in a different God? How can you build a different character of God in your mind and heart and soul? Believe in that. The firmament of the heavens declare the glory of God. We as common people, we miss all of God's creation. if you don't believe in God. I didn't once think of any of these things before I was a Christian. Mm -hmm. right. I knew they were there, but I didn't understand the beauty of them mm -hmm. and the glory of them, who made them, 
who put them there for me to enjoy. I just went down to the river to drink. <laughs> I didn't look at the sea, or the, the waves. I didn't look at the stars. And so did you. <laughs> Amen? So the question is not, is it God that is responsible for this? The honest question is God a sinner? My heart is degraded. My mind is degraded. I don't believe in your truth. And that's the honest question you have to ask yourself. I've created a false God in my own heart, mind, and soul. It's not the God of the Bible. It's the God of my own imagination. And that's why we need Jesus. That's why we need the preaching of the gospel, the truth. Because you are responsible. You are responsible for not serving Christ. You are responsible for walking away from Jesus. You are the one responsible, it's not God. All of us were held accountable before the Lord when someone preached to us the truth. We became accountable before God for that truth. So we were responsible for the things we did. And after you receive Christ, you again are responsible how you walk with Christ. It's not God's responsibility, it's your responsibility to serve the Lord. So God is what? What is God? God is Jesus. Jesus Christ is more than just a swear word, guys, ladies. He's just more than a fragment of your imagination. Jesus said to the Pharisees, the religious rulers of the time, you say that you know God, but you deny me. And because you deny me, you don't even know God. So that breaks down the religious barrier, doesn't it? Religion will not save you. Religion will take you away further from God and confuse you. Christianity will save you. Christianity is simply believing that Jesus died for you rose again on the third day, confessing with your mouth, asking him in your heart to forgive you of your sins and then being obedient to Christ as much as lies within you and living a Christian life. That's what Christian is, to be like Christ. What did Jesus do when he walked the earth? Fed the poor. Amen. Prayed for people to see them be healed. Took dominion over everything in his life, walked righteously, honestly before his God, walked away from sin, confronted sin in others. The character of God needs to be in us. Many people in the world think like this. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I said a prayer a long time ago. Guess I'm okay. I guess I'm going to heaven. I don't go to church. I don't read my Bible. I don't pray. I don't ask God to forgive me because I said a prayer. And I'm saved. They ask Christ into the life and then they live in their own corruptness. And believe in God when he comes is going to call them home. That's called deception. Nowhere in the Bible you'll see a read, once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. But you read the word repent. You read the word ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You read get right with God. Amen. Otherwise, all of us here can just say a prayer, live like the devil, and believe we're going to heaven. You want. Feel any of God's grace, His mercy. You won't feel any of God's long suffering. You won't feel any of His love. None of that. His forgiveness. 
Jesus said, He that beholdeth me, beholdeth him that sent me. Or he said to Philip, He that hath seen me has seen the Father. Jesus and his Father are one. You cannot represent them, or you cannot separate them. To deny one, you give up the privilege of knowing the other. You cannot deny God, you cannot deny Jesus, you can't just serve God and say no to Jesus. Otherwise you can't be religious and deny the Christ. Amen? They deny the power of God. That means they say they're saved, but they deny the power of God. Otherwise they don't want to walk after Christ. Because they have their own view of who God is. They have their own view of the character of God. So instead of serving the God of the Bible, they serve their own view, their own thoughts of who the Lord is. That's why there's so many messed up people in the world. Amen? Amen? Do you talk to Christian people? Do you talk to people who say they know the Lord? And come to the conclusion that they're not serving God. They're serving their own thoughts of who God is. Then you try to correct them, they get mad at you and yell at you. Why are you yelling? I'm standing right beside you. Numbers 14, 11. The Lord said to Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will the people of God provoke him? He's talking to his own people. How long are you going to provoke me and make me mad? When are you going to serve me properly? When are you going to acknowledge that I am God? How long will, they believe, will it be till they believe me? How long is it going to be until people really believe Enough to be obedient to Christ and live a Christian lifestyle. Mm -hmm. How long? That's what he's asking them. For all the signs that I have showed among them, he says, I've showed them all these signs, and they still don't believe. What more can I do? I fed them. I put a cloud over the head in the daytime. I gave them fire at night so they could be comfortable. I fed them manna for 40 years, and all they did was complain, so I sent quail down and choked them to death while they were eating. <laughs> How long? He's upset. All he wants his people to do is to believe on him, serve him, and love him. That's all he asks. But we have our own mindsets, our own character of God, and we go off in a different way. Well, that's not what I believe God says in the Bible. I don't really care what you believe. That's what it says. And that's what we need to do. Amen. The Bible is very simple. Christianity is very simple. Read the Bible. And God tells you this is what it's okay. Repent. Okay. Change. Okay. It's pretty simple. It's just like raising children. Dad comes and says something to you and you can either say okay or no. You say okay, things go well. You say no, you kind of walk like this. <laughs> Ooh, can't sit down for a while. Or you get your privileges taken away. Or you don't eat supper, you go to your room. You get some form of punishment for your disobedience. Right? I wonder what quail tastes like. I don't want to I said all this because unbelief dishonors Jesus Christ. When you doubt Jesus, it is unwarranted. Because Jesus has never given you the slightest ground to sus for suspicion about who he is. Jesus is the Son of God. With unsurmountable mercy for you, for me, and it's a shame to doubt the omnipotent Father. He's never given us any room to do that. Why do we doubt God? Why do we have unbelief? 
He is God, the Son of God. So you want to live a full, abundant life? How many here want to live a full, abundant life? Christ. He says, I've come to give you life and that life more abundantly. My question is, are you ready? Are you certain you are equipped to receive such a life? Are you ready to lay down your life for His? Are you ready to give up your own idiosyncrasies? Your own selfishness? Your own self-will? To put on the Lord Jesus Christ? To take up your cross daily and follow Him? That's the question you have to answer, ask yourself and answer it. Am I ready to receive the abundant life Christ wants to give me? Am I willing? And that's what you have to tell the Lord. Jesus says, my peace I give unto you, not the peace of this world, but he says, I give you my peace. I want the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Amen. We live in an unpeaceful world. A world of confusion. This is what we live in. So we need the peace of God as we live in life. Because there's a lot of things that will happen in life. Do you want the peace of the Lord? Jesus can open your conscience towards truth. And that's what he needs to do. He needs to open your conscience towards his truth. So you can live with convictions. And when you live with convictions, and you follow those convictions, and you repent, God gives you peace. Or you live with the convictions of the word and say, no, this is what the Bible says, this is what we're going to do. When you say those words, God hears that and he brings peace in the midst of your troubles and trials, tribulations. So Jesus can open your conscience towards truth and Jesus can strengthen the weak. When I am weak, he is strong. This is what Paul said. When I am poor, we are rich. Jesus can possess you with his divine resources to live a full life, a victorious life, a life of peace. Peace is harmony. Peace is intense life. It's an intense life of Christ. Don't tell me you didn't live an intense life without Christ. Because you did. And he wants you to live that way with Christ. Peace is being full of joy. Peace is possessing inadequate resources for an overcoming and abundant life. And that resource is Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives you peace. But so many times when we're facing things, we don't go to Christ to find peace in Him. That's our last resort. We try everything. We go, oh, maybe we should pray. Change that around. When you go through something, I think I'm going to pray. And then you pray, and then you go ask somebody and help to ask you for help. And then they say something to you, and you go, oh, that's just a confirmation of what God told me when I prayed. Amen. Amen? So who is God to you? What character have you formed in your mind and heart who Jesus Christ is? Let's bow our heads. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says that Jesus Christ's name is Emmanuel. God with us. You're here this morning, and you know God's not with you. Without a shadow of a doubt, you know. Maybe you were saved at one point in your life, and you walked away from God because life got busy. You went your own way, did your own thing, and you didn't ask Christ to come with you. Jesus wants you back. He's calling you back to Him. That's you. You're backslidden. You walk away from the Lord. You've ignored Christ for a while. But you say, Lord, I don't want to ignore you anymore. I want you into my life. Be honest with the Lord. Be honest with yourself. Make heaven your home. Make heaven your home. That's my answer to receive Christ in all over this place. You're not saved. You need to be born again. Raise your hand. We want to pray for you. We want the Lord to help you. We want God to help you. 
Amen. Or you've had in your mind, and you form who God is differently. You form the character of God in your mind differently. And God's spoken to you. Somewhere in this sermon, God has spoken to you. We have an altar here. It's called an altar of thanksgiving, where you come, you stand before God, lift up your hands, and you go, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Amen. Moses used to read the word before the congregation, and then they would worship God and thank him for his word, for the declaration of the word of God. That's all about this for us, to come and thank the Lord for his word and what he's spoken to you. Amen.